So we have a great um, uh, panel uh, for you here uh, today. Um, to uh, my immediate left, uh, Jason Hoffman, uh, who is the CEO of uh, Mobile Edge X, which is part of Deutsche Telekom, right? Yes, sir. Um, we have uh, right next to him, um, Vijay uh, Dradla, the Chief uh, Business Officer um, for uh, Spark Cognition. Uh, and uh, down at the end uh, of the uh, other side of the stage for me, Zvi Marom, uh, the CEO of BATM uh, Advanced Communications uh, in Israel. Um, and we recognize that we are basically serving sort of two different purposes today. One is to have a conversation about the future of 5G technology and what that revolution is. And the second is to try to pace our way through what's important and what isn't in this debate over its national security uh, implications. So we're going to try to, to uh, do both. But um, let me start um, with the first and the most basic, which is um, we all know that 5G is supposed to speed up dramatically uh, the speed at which we're able to download over cell networks mm. on our phones. But it's also vastly more than that. It's a change of architecture uh, to some degree for the basic highway of the internet. And it is a way to integrate internet of things devices in a way that we never have before. So um, Jason, let me ask you to just start uh, because um, your own uh, connections in the, uh, in, in the telecom delivery world, and of course Deutsche Telekom's uh, interest in Mobile Edge X, um, uh, tell us a little bit about what we should expect from this technology, how long it should take to roll it out, what it's gonna cost to do that. Oh yeah, no, great, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I mean, as you, as, as you said, 5G being the, the fifth generation uh, of, of wireless connectivity. You know, it's just important to just quickly recall that, you know, first G launched in 1979, it was about voice. 2G was about voice and messaging. Uh, 3G was about, you know, voice messaging and the internet shows up. 4G was about everything turning into data. You know, so the idea that you have a smartphone and voice is a feature of your data plan. Messaging is a feature of your data plan. It was all about going to this sort of very data-centric type architecture. But if we think about what's occurred in the case of 4G is, you know, we largely have these supercomputers we keep in our pockets. Uh, we stare down at them. Uh, they're the types of devices we still use by ourselves. Uh, the main use cases are things like selfies, pictures of food, you know, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of those types of, you know, trivialities sort of, if, if you will. 5, 5G marks then the Pictures first... Pictures of food are not trivialities. Let's just set <laughs> oh, no, that out. It is pretty much the second most common thing done with a smartphone. It's <laughs> pictures, of, pictures of, of food. And that's excluding alcohol. If you include alcohol, it's number one. Um, but, you know, but if you look at that, then 5G is about a couple of things. It's, it's about uh, us you know, sort of using our smartphones like this to sort of us coming up and using them more like a window to the world, right? And whether you call it mixed reality, augmented reality, and a number of things like that. But starting to think about what happens when it's not just your smartphone, it's your watch, an activity tracker, uh, you know, uh, glasses, a headset, uh, the windows in your home, the mirrors in your homes, the televisions, so one of the big architectural features of 5G is to handle many different types of devices other than a smartphone, uh, but to have it with a, a, you know, a, a common identity and you know, a common sort of back end and, and everything else like that. But it marks this point where the second you have many people, many devices, uh, many applications, many viewers, many observers, uh, collaborative social type sort of engagement around these devices, 5G is required to accomplish those things. Uh, and then lastly, the, the big break is the base sort of 5G technologies is meant to enable these devices to impact more than the industries they've impacted to date. So, you know, media, retail, advertising is pretty much all that mobile technologies has gone and disrupted so far. 
Uh, 5G then means that insurance, healthcare, supply chain, transportation, logistics, every other sort of known industry now then has use cases that are applicable because of that. That's, that's a big help. And um, just give us a sense, uh, before I, I press VJ on a couple of other elements of it, of timeline and cost. So yep. um, everybody in the U.S. government who I talk to about this who was revved up on the security issues we'll get to in, the, in a moment, say really the next nine months to 15 months are critical yeah. because yeah. every government in the world is going to have to basically allot their spectrum and sell right. that off right. in order to get going on this or, or lose out on the revolution. And so if there's going to be a defining moment in whose networks are going to win out, and who man, what countries are going to manufacture them, it's really going to play out very fast. In the next 18 to 24 months, yeah. I mean, because when you look at, if you use 4G as an example, you know, that, that starts, you know, floating around 2004. It goes into full rollout in 2009. Between 2009 and 2019, you know, roughly $2.5 trillion was spent globally rolling out 4G. Uh, we're still, you know, depending on the country, not even at 100% penetration of, of that. There'll be another trillion and a half spent just doing you know, the 4G type, type sort of things. In the case of 5G, uh, the standard gets definitely set uh, by 2020. Uh, many of the more advanced uh, countries are doing rollouts now, uh, next year. Uh, and you know, they're, they're also exceptionally motivated to do it because there are a lot of benefits to the operator to do it. Um, but you'll see most countries, you know, US, uh, you know, Europe, uh, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, China, uh, will largely be going, you know, 5G as the default by 2020, 2021, 2022. Uh, and the rollout will occur faster than the LT rollout. So we'll be sitting 2025, 2026. And does it have greater penetration ability for rural areas? That's always been the hardest issue, certainly in the United States. Uh, it, it, there are some benefits. There, there are some additional benefits to that. Um, and then on the thing... Uh, you know, being that there's, there's, there's some concepts around, uh, you know, having smaller cells that are attached to fixed line, and, and there, there, there'll be some benefits some, there. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a lot more money is going to be spent rolling out 5G. So most estimates put it at about 3.8 to about $5 trillion will be spent for a 5G rollout. Great. So um, let me ask you, Vijay, uh, as you um, think about the kind of transition this is going to allow. You spend a lot of time thinking about artificial intelligence applications, autonomous vehicle applications, and so forth. Um, tell us about the applications of 5G we're going to see that have nothing to do with our cell phone. Right. Um, so before I answer the question, I'd like to tack on a couple of more um, uh, sort of numbers, that, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, backing J what Jason just mentioned. If you look at the, um, the reason why this is so important, right, is because if you dial back and look at what has happened over the last decade, um, the digital economy has grown two and a half times faster than the global GDP. Right, 4.4% mm -hmm. of the global GDP right now is tied up with mobile services and applications, right? Yeah. And from 2006, uh, 2016 to 2022... And that, that's not going to slow down either. It's not going to slow down. 2016 to 22, the, the amount of traffic forecasted to increase on the network is 10x, mm -hmm. all right? And I don't think that includes the 5G rollout, right? Yeah. Because you're at the early stages of the first right. Rollout, That's right? normal stuff. Now, if you look at what is happening here um, and look at the convergence of the cloud, uh, the mobile uh, uh, network, so the connectivity, e-commerce, and social, there's been an explosion uh, in terms of new business ideas and new business models, which in many cases are asset-free, right? So think about the ride-sharing market, which is an asset-less business model, right? You don't own a car, you, you essentially have software and you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, the the ride-sharing market alone is expected to be close to $220 billion by 2025, right? So that sort of, uh, you know, is to put this into context as to why this is so important, it's important because 
the, um, this is sort of um, you know, creating a trigger of explosion of new ideas, new business models, which were never thought before, right? Now, now going to your question about what, uh, what happens uh, when 5G comes into the market and um, there's some level of ubiquity around the, uh, around the technology, it triggers a completely different sort of go-to-market around things that were never being done before. I'll give you an example, right? Um, we are, um, we're, we're building the operating system of autonomous flying drones with Boeing, um, and you need connectivity if you have, you know, a, a drone flying from point A to point B. Um, you don't want a network to sort of, you know, uh, cop out on you, right? So, um, so you, you're talking about 5G, you're talking about 4G, you're talking about redundancy in the network, right? Um, that's something that um, will happen. I mean, uh, the CEO of Boeing, Dennis Muhlenberg, uh, believes that's going to happen in the next 10 years, right? Another example is one of the biggest, uh, you know, uh, challenges for a manufacturing line this is one of the use cases that have been talked about, and Jason, mm -hmm. you've probably seen this before, uh, is um, the connectivity between the manufacturing line and the hub of, of the manufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. right? So the devices that are connected to the hub, which is obviously connected to the network, there's, there's an issue in terms of how many, how, many, how many devices can you connect to the hub, right? With 5G, that exponentially increases, which translates into the ability to convert um, and repurpose a manufacturing line in, in, in a matter of hours. It's, it's, it's ba 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 everything that could be connected is going to be connected. Right. Yeah. So these are some of the use cases that I think would uh, probably be, you know, front and center in, as 5G. Right. Yeah. So Z, um, please go rain on our parade here a little bit. So the wonder of this is we're going to have vastly more mobility. Every place we go will have the kind of rich textual data that you could right now only get if you're connected to your office or home network, and probably better than that. We'll have this world of autonomous vehicles that are constantly in communication. And yet we have governments around the world freaking out about the thought that this is going to end up being a dividing technology, one in which you're either under the control of a Chinese authoritarian kind of model or one where you are under the control of a Western free model. Hmm. Is there reason for this concern? Is it valid? Yes, it's very valid. I would just would like to add, the, in order to understand the, the issue better to what my colleague said, if we talk about 5G, there are two key words. One is more. More applications, some of them have not been available before, like drones, like precision agriculture, etc., etc. It's not about mobile phones. Yeah. But the second key word is the one. Everything will be internet. Everything. So it means that whoever controls the internet or supply the whole ecosystem around the internet basically controls the world of communication. Ah. Now, something about the Chinese. I will start with the Chinese and then uh, go to the favorite subject of your president. Uh, <laughs> the Chinese, <laughs> yes. The Chinese basically now, and we are not talking specifically about Huawei because it can be ZTE or any other Chinese uh, uh, big company, in all their equipment, and this is not an assumption, this is a fact, are doing two things. One of them, clearly they are looking on the data stream and on the storage all the time for espionage purposes, for lots of things, but they are looking on the streams with their equipment, or at least they have the ability to look and they look. But the second one is far more dangerous. They put all kinds of small dangerous midgets inside their equipment that can be called in time of conflicts and basically... I'm sorry, can be called in called times upon of conflict. Mm -hmm. In time of conflict. conflict. Uh -huh. And if there is a conflict and the Chinese will decide to paralyze your equipment, to uh, collapse your communication system, basically they can do it. And this is the danger, because just imagine that tomorrow there is a dispute about Taiwan, 
and all of a sudden any Huawei based network or ZTE based network stop to work. What kind of, of danger it is to national security, to commercial networks, etc., etc. So let me uh, press you on this, V, especially because your company, as we were discussing before we came out, does a lot of encryption uh, work. So you're pretty familiar with encryption technologies. You've identified two different potential vulnerabilities. One is shut down the network or divert the traffic Damage. from it, right? And the second is sur a surveillance ability of the traffic on the network. On the shutdown, I understand where your concern is. On the surveillance part, assuming that we're all encrypting our data, why would it be particularly vulnerable to the Chinese or anybody else reading it if you're just very careful that the data that you put across that network is encrypted? I mean, they'll see the metadata, but they won't see the content, presumably. No. Well, the belief that you cannot see the content is... Uh, is a little bit, I would say, naive, because uh -huh. uh, basically, first, not all the, the traffic is uh, encrypted, but even if encrypted, if it's not uh, really a kind of a high-grade uh, encryption, you definitely can decrypt it and look Definitely. very well inside. Certainly, if you are talking about a level of a country that decides to, to make it. And um, obviously, if you look in, in, in a kind of, uh, if we're talking 5G or 4G or whatever, the whole idea about mobility is the freedom of the person, the freedom of the society, the freedom of the economy, etc., etc., while the Chinese are using a big chunk of it in, in the other way around. They are actually using it for massive surveillance against their own population, and they can use it for actually getting a lot of economic advantages in a ways that we cannot accept. Well, and we have, I mean, there's some, <clears throat> I mean, the question always on these things is how, how instructive is the past about the future? And, and we, we do in fact see that there's, China has its own wired internet. Uh, and uh, the rest of the world has another wired internet. And, and they do have different capabilities and they're used for different purposes and they have different access to things and the like. Um, now, that's always been somewhat okay because it's anchored in a physical asset that you bury in the ground and you call it fiber, cable, you know, anything else like that. But the, your network itself has the same geographical boundaries as your country, right? right? In the case of all of that turning into wireless, because we all prefer wireless, cordless, hands-free as human beings anyway, in the case of wireless, you're talking about using light. I mean, the same sort of base technology that you'd use to communicate between planet Earth and a spaceship or between planets or with a satellite or sort of anything else. You know, there in fact is not the physical asset of spectrum itself is, you know, the constraints around that are artificial. Right, you know, the idea that you own the air above the ground that you have, um, the technical constraints on that don't exist is the same as, you know, dig a hole in the ground and run cable in it. You know, and so the question being when you sort of take the example of the wired and then you move it to wireless, you know, is the future going to look like the past? And it, it, it probably will. Uh, and Until I think times get tough. Well, and I think there's this question of, you know, do you want you know, a networking design and sort of approach that gets exported out via global spectrum, you know, that essentially continues to reinforce what is a surveillance culture or not. So tell us what you've learned for a moment in Germany, because there the Huawei and other Chinese makers, but mostly Huawei, have got nearly half of the radio connection of the network. And just to explain to people, there's sort of two big things when you've you got to think about here. One is the switching capability, which in 5G is mostly software. And then you've also got the mobile or radio part, which is what happens as you beam out from the um, towers to our cell phones and other devices. Mm -hmm. So what's the experience been in Germany with Chinese manufacturers having 45% of the of the uh, radio. You know, I, well, and I think it's in, in other in other markets as well. And and I'll probably lean more on my, my time at Ericsson than, than mm -hmm. make specific comments about Germany. But um, 
you know, the saving grace of this is you do have a standards process where everybody participates in the standards around what the components should be, what the architectures are, how they should interoperate. And so one of the things that's very helpful is when the systems have to interoperate in a given way and be replaceable, you know, that, that helps sort of dilute out some, some influence. Um, the most important thing is just to be aware of the risk. And so what you tend to have in most of the countries that use equipment there is a very large team and process before it's actually rolled out around uh, analyzing everything from hardware to software up, their requirements around you know, source code access and everything else like that. Um, and then there tends to be very large sort of cyber teams after the fact uh, as well that are like standing teams that you know, are sort of watching the watchers uh, in many ways. So it does place additional operational burdens on top of that. And in fact, when you look at some of the challenges is even if the equipment ends up being cheaper, operating it under those risk profiles is not, right? So, so you end up having that, that as a discovery. You know, but when you're doing very, you know, let's get the cheapest equipment possible and so on like that, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can make different sort of procurement decisions, you know, sort of around there. Um, you know, the other thing is, is when you look at the base components of it, you know, the U.S. is still at least a decent provider of base components. So many of the chips are still made by companies like Intel. The FPGAs tend to be here. Base comp software components tend to be there. So at least sort of a lot of the core parts that live within the architecture, you know, tend to be U.S. created. You know, what we've given up in this country is, you know, essentially then taking these parts and going up into full-blown solutions that get operated and sort of rolled out. Meaning the big switches themselves. Yeah. 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 And Vijay, tell us what, yeah. how did that happen? Well, th that's a great, you know, it's a fascinating sort of story if you tell, look at the tell, history the telecommunications of telecommunications act of 1996. If you if you put this in the lens of of capital markets, right? Think about this, right? Back in 1995, there were s seven suppliers between the U.S. and Europe, okay, building equipment for mobile networks, right? And fast forward now from 1995 to 2018, there are five global players right now. So, so of the seven, five have disappeared, have merged. And um, if you look at the global players right now, three of the five are Asian suppliers. So Tell us who those are. So there's uh, Huawei, ZTE, Samsung, Ericsson, and Nokia. That's right. Mm -hmm. So well, and he's talking about the transition into 4G. If you go back the previous generation, yeah. there were 16 suppliers. Right, exactly. Right. Now, if you look at the capital markets itself um, and look at what happened to Lucent, as an example, in Bell Labs, right? Yeah. Um, at one point, nine Nobel Prizes, the transistor, the voltaic cell, um, Unix operating system, everything was, was invented in, in Bell Labs, right? And uh, the storied institution with which hit a market cap, I think, of $258 billion at one point, essentially, you know, uh, disappeared um, while, um, while you have Asian suppliers coming in. You know, I think Huawei's revenue this last year was $100 billion, right? Mm -hmm. So now the question comes about capitalism versus some level of funding that is not capitalistic, right? How do you keep a, how do you keep a competitive edge when you're in a capitalistic society in a competitive environment versus you have an unlimited uh, you know sort of balance sheet to build and build your your technology right so the question the, the big question is would huawei have survived if it was outside of china i doubt it would ha would you I mean no vc would have funded huawei or, or, or even emerge in the first place um, right so so I, that brings a very fascinating question about where we are right now right is like um it's the sort of the off, offshoots of our capitalistic, you know. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the issues on this is it's a bit of, it's a problem that's been, it's a 30-year-old problem. Uh, I mean, it's been cooking for the last 30 years. And, and so, you know, in the U.S., what happened is you had, of course, the, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 pass, which, you know, de deregulated the industry in the U.S., you know, what it, and it was meant to lead to greater competition and everything else like that. What it led to was a massive consolidation in the U.S. space, which always allows operators to put more procurement pressure on their vendors, right? So you had that event occur. Uh, and it wasn't just Lucent. I mean, 2, 2G was created by Motorola. Exactly. Motorola. And, you know, Motorola's yep. not a player in the space yep. anymore either. And then you had a thing where Europe went with GSM 
as a technology. The U.S. didn't uh, in there. And then you also had things happen within, particularly like in Ericsson, where the strategy back then was um, the U.S. will be a system, Europe will be a system, and the rest of the world gets something else. Uh, that's what they were told. Uh, that, that's what they were basically saying at the time. You know, China was at this transition of going from 2G into 3G, and you know, they went into China where they had dominant, literally like 95% market share of 2G, and said, we're not going to build a Chinese-specific 3G. You need to take the rest of the world example, or you're going to take the Europe example or the U.S. example. And China's response was largely to start and fund Huawei in that case. And then Huawei did a very, very smart thing. They made a 3G system uh, that had 2G as a feature and was fully compatible with 2G, uh, and the rest of the world made these things that sort of broke away. And so it, it's a, it's a, it was a combination of, of U.S. law and sort of policies that was done here, uh, a standards process within Europe, and then just literally about two strategic choices made in certain vendors about how to treat China from that perspective. And then we're largely living with the consequences of things that were done between 1989 and 1996 right now. Okay. So, I, Z, we're living in a world now where the Secretary of State, a National Security Advisor, the Vice President, are traveling the world, particularly in Europe, but not exclusively in Europe, some in the Middle East, and they have one message. If you go with a Chinese design network, a Huawei design network instead of the Ericsson or um, uh, Nokia. Right, Nokia or anybody else from, from Europe out there, or even Samsung, we're going to cut off your intelligence because we can't guarantee that the um, communications will be secure. First of all, believable threat or not? And secondly, what's the reaction around the world and in Israel when you hear these kinds of, of discussions? Well, I don't think the administration have much of a choice. Uh, the response to what China did was very mild, far too mild. If we look on companies like Huawei, basically they started by copying and they admitted it, the Cisco equipment, mm -hmm. including the protocol, including the software, including doing reverse engineering and so on, so on, so on. Now, uh, there is no way that any company in the Western world can compete with the government of China when the government of China provide yeah. endless funding, basically. Yeah, that's great and that. it's great to lots, have a country. Lots, lots of, uh, <laughs> you know, lots of know-how that has been basically stolen. So, uh, in, in that aspect, the, the, the American government is 100% right. Now, the only way, China now is too big. Huawei is too big. You cannot avoid them, but you have to contain them. And to contain them, you can do in three, three steps. Uh, the first one is, of course, threatening your allies, but, but in reality, what you have to do is first to expose the Chinese, to say, hey, guys, you know, here we have this, here we have that, and here we have that. Then threat the Chinese that unless they will stop it, they will pay very dearly, I mean financially, and third step is to execute it. Like the Huawei is f uh, paid, I don't remember how much, but in the billions, fines about their, uh, uh, what they did to Cisco. It should be very clear to them that if they continue with the way that they are doing it, it they will be excluded from the Western society because they uh, uh, are actually a threat to our way of life, not just a simple commercial threat. And in Israel, we take it very seriously. We looked on the Huawei equipment to the level of every single chip there, and what we found is not very pleasant. Well, tell us what you found. <laughs> okay. I, I am a kind of uh, limited in what I can tell, but uh, uh, the, the fact that Huawei is having... Uh, there were non-surprising, surprising things on yes, it. Yes, yes. We were not surprised from what... The, this is not a commercial company stuff. This is a kind of nearly a military-grade stuff. Now, to, to understand 
what is the value proposal of Huawei, especially in developing countries, they provide you with the mobile phones, with the infrastructure, with oh. everything at a bargain oh. price, oh, sometimes yeah, sometime almost nearly free of charge. This is the Chinese way that they are doing with the Silk Road. They give you a lot of credit, lots of stuff, and then five years later you wake up and you see that there is no free well, so So a very common behavior is people don't exactly know who's going to win an auction when you're auctioning for Spectrum. So very often as a vendor, as you do come in and you will build the entire network beforehand. Mm -hmm. And then whoever wins the auction gets that network. Uh, and when you couple that with devices they're selling in the store where they're actually making more money from the devices than that, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, really great financing coming from, you know, banks you have access to and everything else. It's a very compelling offer because in a lot of cases, you know, you're essentially getting a one to four billion dollar network with, you know, it's like going and buying a, you know, Honda Civic. I mean, you literally go and say, I'll take that. You drive it off the lot and you make monthly payments, uh, you know, on there. Um, now, you know, I, I think, look, the general concern I hear from, from uh, pe people that work on the, the policy side is, you know, the, the concern is that chi Chinese law compels any company or citizen to assist in Chinese intelligence efforts. And that, you know, I, I guess that would be okay if there was also an independent judiciary that was open that you could go and sue if that sort of showed up. Um, but you don't have a... There hasn't been a successful case like that in China. Yet. The, there, yeah, <laughs> the, the state's never lost in the judicial system in China. You know, so, so the whole issue is that the, the whole thing is basically set up as a secret court system with, with that. Uh, and we know that the consequences of breaking Chinese law, if you're Chinese in China, uh, is, can be serious. Yep. Uh, you know, from that, that sort of perspective. Um, and so that, that's usually the core of what those arguments tend to be. Now, then on the operator side, the usual comment to the Americans from non-Americans is, okay, well, you know, do you have our alter do you have the alternatives? The alternatives being, are, are, are you going to provide us with what this is? Are, are you going to build it out sort of independent of this? Are you going to help us from a wholesale perspective? Can we get it financed? You know, can you invest in sort of the business that we're going and doing? You know, so then sort of the reality of what it takes to truly sort of follow up it does require us, you know, whether it be from the, the government or other organizations in the U.S. to have a much more sort of concerted effort around, you know, fixing, you know, the actual operational and financial challenges then. So, VJ, um, every time that I go to U.S. government officials or even to the American carriers and I say, okay, I hear the vulnerabilities. I understand that this switch is largely software, and therefore it's going to be updated every few days. So even if this week's version has no backdoors to it, that's no guarantee of what next week's will look like. But then Huawei comes along and says, do you folks, can you show us one moment, one time, when you think we have diverted traffic, where we have used a backdoor in our equipment, Show us what it is, because we've got the Snowden documents over here, and we can show you a dozen times that the U.S. has gone in and gotten our data in various places, but you haven't named one for China. I, so I, I think the whole, my, my, you know, your dog poops in my yard, so my dog can poop on your yard is often a, what do they call that, a straw man? I think. Straw dog, yeah. Straw dog. <laughs> um, but. TJ? Well, you know, um, it, it's, you know, I'm not an expert in national security, I'll be very honest with you, but I think uh, the bigger question in my mind as, you know, wearing the hat of a chief business officer is, um, is uh, the trajectory of where we're going, right? And as 5G comes in, and when artificial intelligence comes into the network, the implications could be staggering. Right. Think about the fact that in 2017, China spent $12 billion um, on AI, right? And that spend is expected to increase to $70 billion by 2025. The number of, um, you know, research papers uh, uh, with citation um, has from China. So essentially research papers um, uh, has is significantly higher than the U.S. in AI, right? Um, 
What you're saying is they're not stealing this technology; they're investing it. No, they are. It, I think because they're building it the good old-fashioned way. Right? Yeah. They are because you know we've 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 uh, we've crossed the chasm, so to say, so to speak, of the the sort of the low-hanging fruits of the core competencies required for these economies to sort of take off on their own. Right? So what applied maybe 10, 15 years ago probably doesn't apply. Think about the market capitalization of the of the companies that were built in China for the first time in the history. Um, there were more billionaires created in China, 55, versus in the U.S., which was 53, and most of the billionaires were around technology, right? So now all of a sudden you have this core competency, and look at the STEM. You know, STEM is just staggering, right? For the first time in 2016, I think China had more graduates than the U.S. China and India. I think China had 77 million graduates. India had 78, and the U.S. had uh, 67.5 million. And in the snapshot in 2016, the World, World Economic Forum uh, said that there were um, 4.76 million STEM graduates in China compared, and India had 2.2, and the U.S. had like 578,000. Right. So now all of a sudden you have this, um, you know, group of, uh, you know, local talent. A captive market you can serve and make money, um, and so the, I think the equation changes going forward. I mean, you, I mean you, you, you really see this on the education side. I mean, I mean, even when you start thinking, I mean, the, the reality is when you look at 5G networks, they are designed and very often made by people that have PhDs in the subject, right? And you look at the, the top 20 universities in the space. I mean, 10 of the top 20 are in China. If you include Hong Kong in that, it becomes 13 of the top 20. Uh, I mean, Singapore is, of course, not 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 the same. But you know, if you just think Asia, you know, now you're up to like 14. You know, you have one in Sweden, which is KTH. You know, in America, you know, the top 20 programs are, are at University of Texas Austin and Georgia Tech. You know, but you're basically sitting where, you know, 14 out of the top 20 schools in the space are in Asia. Uh, 13 of them are under, you know, Chinese government. You know, in in their Geographies, uh, you know, in there, uh, and then you head into like the numbers of graduates. You don't even then then it gets even more skewed. I mean, a KTH in Sweden spits you out. You would expect, given the different populations, but yeah, right. yeah. But when you're when you're when it's one of these ones where uh, the Sweden Sweden and the two schools in the U.S. generate in the order of 80 PhDs in a year in the subject, and, and China's doing roughly about 7,000. It's a big difference, right? Uh, and um, so, you know, again, a lot of the times we're, we're talking about because you know, 5G, and this is the important of the context. 5G has to be put in the context of what was done in 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G. It also has to be put in the context of what 6G will be, 7G will be, 8G will be, 9G will be, 10G will be. I mean, there are active conversations on the characteristics of 6G and 7G today. Uh, in that. You know, we're talking about things today, right now, where 5G is the consequences of things that were kicked off in 1967, taken live in 1979. We're now 40 years later on the fifth generation of these types of things uh, in there, uh, and it requires active government policy, educational, and the financial community participation in what is a, a nearly a, you know. Decade to century-long infrastructure plan about truly what you're planning on doing as a nation, mm -hmm. and nations that are taking on that effort um, are few and far between. And you know, China happens to be one of them. So, um, yeah. so uh, V, let me yeah. press you on one element of this. So you said you picked apart the Chinese stuff, and it wasn't pretty. So. I'm assuming from that that you mean you see a lot of military-grade equipment that could be used, but aren't isn't necessarily being used to create a pathway back to Beijing. Should they? No, that's not what I said. I said there are no assumptions. It's being done. That's a big difference between the two. Okay. Now I want to refer. It's true that China is building its own intellectual power. Still, the U.S. is making far more intellectual property than China. Sure. Yeah. And definitely, it doesn't steal it from others, but it creates it. It's a big we, difference. We have a system to protect. And China, at the very same time that they are building their own intellectual capabilities, is stealing. 
is not potentially stealing, is stealing and saying uh, proof to us the Chinese know very well and if uh, certain organizations in the States like the NSA wanted to prove it, they can prove it in one day. They can, you know, finger yeah, out lots of events that it's that being done, not um, theoretically, yeah, yeah. but practically. And furthermore, the second danger that I pointed out that uh, this, this hardware can be operating in time of emergency or conflict is, is a fact, is not assumption. Now, the issue is, the big difference is that there is no price on freedom. And, you know, kind of getting cheap Chinese equipment because for the moment, like BT did a few years ago, because it looks to you attractive, especially in, in, in kind of developing countries, is a big, big mistake. Because it's the same thing that these countries are seeing now with all kind of loans that they've been getting for the Silk Road that all of a sudden you, use your, you lose your independence. So it's not assumption what the Chinese are doing, they are doing it, and they have to stop it. Well, and the, cha the challenge always with us is whenever these things, you know, whenever somebody says, well, you know, can you prove it, can you talk about it? I mean, having, well, been, been stuck in the, in the middle of a few of these, I mean, one of the challenges always is um, when these things are discovered, it's it, literally even within a, a, a company, everything ends up being on a need-to-know basis. Uh, it, it ends up getting escalated in a path that... So it's way over-classified that's stepping up... Well, the and, then, it. and then you look, the general, the general sort of response on, on say, the, the U.S. side too is like it's, it's more important to actually be aware of something, keep an eye on it, know it, maybe exploit it yourself. I mean, it rapidly moves into being a protected piece of knowledge itself uh, and uh, like I've not uh, <laughs> I've not I've not seen any examples where the results of any of these things ended up not being under a certain classification scheme or so on like that where then then anybody in the case and it's like well you know go ahead and talk about it and it's like oh okay I can go ahead and talk about it and basically violate the laws of my country okay. um, and so you know you're in a situation where um, you know, um, you know, and I think we're just we're now in some ways having a conversation within polite company that we we weren't having a couple of years ago. You know, but but even our own general way that we respond to these things makes it so that we can't actually go and publicly. So one question for all of you before we open this up to um, to broader questions here. So um, tell us what the world is going to look like this world of 5G, seven years from now. Are we going to have a world in which Chinese-dominated networks control 40 to 60 percent of the world networks, and we're going to have to connect into them and learn how to live over dirty networks? Are we going to live in a world in which people are going to wake up in the way V says they should and say they're, you can't put a price on freedom, so... We're not going to invest in these? What, what's it going to look like? VJ? <clears throat> I think, um, you know, seven years from now, I think it's going to take a little time for 5G to roll out, obviously, right? I think it's too late to talk about, um, you, know, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, the market share of the vendors supporting these, these technologies, this, this technology, these technologies have been deployed by Chinese vendors, by Korean vendors, by the US, you know, European and US vendors, right? So, and we're inter integrated, interoperating with, with everybody right now as we speak. I don't think that's gonna change. I think it's just, it's just way too late to... Uh, to so you're, what you're basically saying is, prepare to live in a dirty network. I, I, I don't know if... Uh, I mean, I, 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 think, I think it's more, look, it's, it's 1G had a lot of issues that 2G fixed, 3G had a lot of issues that 4G fixed. 5G will have a lot of issues that 6G fixes. The 6G is supposed to be showing up in labs seven years from now. I mean, if even on the, the, the current sort of pushes uh, around that, because again, you have to take this generational view of what does 10 generations of this infrastructure look like, and we're currently in the middle of those generations. Okay. You know, and so I think what we have to do is it's very good we're having conversations like this around 5G. We had similar conversations around 3G, and then we fix some of these things in 4G. There's a lot that we have to do over the next seven years, more heading up into what's going to be the next generation and the next iteration of this, where 
you know, we, we, we can start baking a lot of these concepts into those designs uh, that, that prevent things a bit more, you know, than we have so far. But, yeah, but we, we, yeah I mean, I, I, think, I think, you know, if you look at the promise of 5G and the, the uh, you know, the promise of billions of devices being connected to the edge um, and having connectivity and connectivity, um, you know, a hundred or a thousand times more than what we have, right? It's just not only the consumer connectivity, but the device connectivity, right? Yeah. Um, there's no real way to manage these networks and secure these networks without artificial intelligence. There is going sure. to be an advent of artificial intelligence at the edge. Uh, we're sort of testament to that. We're doing stuff right now at the edge. There's going to be artificial intelligence in the network. As simple examples of being able to predict the failure of a rack in a data center. Um, we're, we're talking to uh, large companies, uh, you know, that build data centers and uh, uh, build equipment. And it's literally impossible to predict the failure of a rack because the p permutations and combinations of trying to do that using a rules-based algorithm is just impossible, right? So that's where artificial intelligence comes in, right? Now think about, you know, a hub of th three billion small devices being connected, let's say, in, in a field, agricultural field or manufacturing facility. How do you manage all these devices, right? You have to have artificial intelligence there to be able to sort of manage the policies and the performance of these uh, connected right. devices, right? So the network is going to be exponentially more complicated. The bandwidth is going to increase. Um, um, I think, um, you know, we're in a world where, you know, things just don't overnight change, right? We, this integration, interoperability is a part, is part of life, right? And I, I'm sort of a glass half full person. I, I think, you know, you know, we, you know, and what Jason said, next generation technologies will be found that can prevent, um, you know, serious sort of, sort of problems in the network. Now, now um, the, the subcontext of what I said is that there's risk of like, 5G being a real mess. <laughs> <coughs> These, so what's it look like in seven well, years? Well, mm. our policy uh. is simple. First, we don't let Huawei control the network. You want to sell devices, and their devices, fine. But you want... By devices, meaning if they want to sell handsets, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, handset is but fine. But they can't sell the yeah, They can't sell system. the switches, the edge routers, the, the edge computing, etc., etc. About artificial intelligence, I remember that I lectured about artificial intelligence in 88, and I said it's better to have artificial intelligence than no intelligence at all. <laughs> so okay. intelligence in general, it's greatly hyped because artificial intelligence at the moment is mainly pattern learning. And this can be a pretty well monitored, let's put it that way. A the world of 5G is not going to be a mess. It's actually simpler to operate than 4G. Uh, devices will interconnect, there is no doubt about it, but the level of security operated by the West will be much, much better, and one of the reasons is what China is doing. I believe that the proactive policy by the government is also will help. I can tell you that uh, my company, it's, it's a public information now, we signed an agreement with ARM of uh, that there is many designs now for 5G that we provided them with a very secure virtual operating system that can address many of the concerns of security oh. of a third party wanting to visit your home without an invitation. Okay. So we have about a little less than 10 minutes left and we wanted to get your questions. Um, don't know if there are microphones floating around, are there? There are, great. So um, we know this not to be a shy crowd. So uh, just know the lights are pretty bright out here. So raise your hand and tell us who you are and have at it. Anybody right here? Yeah, so, uh, Hold on one second. Mike's coming to you. Hi. So give us an idea. Um, 5G versus like a 100 megabit line you would have in your home. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Uh, well, um, so there, there's a thing called fixed, fixed wireless 5G, which means that you'll have like a, a Wi-Fi router at home that's also a 5G hotspot uh, in there. And those are designed to do 1 gigabit to 10 gigabit per second to home. Uh, so in a lot of cases, and this includes the rural examples, rather than laying last mile fiber to the house, uh, you'll have a 5G connection to your home that'll look and feel like Wi-Fi. 
but it'll be 10 to 100 times faster than a 100 megabit per second connection. E even on a phone, it's going to be 10 times faster? Yeah, that's right. I mean, on, on, on phones today, they can go as fast as 1 to 2 gigabits per second on a phone over LTE. Uh, and on larger sort of fake handsets, uh, it goes as high as 70 or 80. You're saying you'll have 10 times faster than a 100? Uh, yeah, the average, I mean, the average, like the average connection you have, like the average broadband connection that an American has today uh -huh. uh, is, 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 um, is literally 99% slower than a 5G connection. Uh, so. uh, okay. I have to say... Um, That's one, the, one one hundredth. The difference of 5G yeah. today, if you can get from any provider dedicated bandwidth, you would probably run movies and very, very fast. So 5G will not improve your situation because if it will be best effort and not dedicated bandwidth, you might end up with getting approximately the same bandwidth, depends on your provider. But the 5G is providing completely different application. This is the, the main idea behind it, is like Internet of Things like drones control, like precision agriculture. This is not available because of lots of technological restrictions versus uh, uh, the system that exists today. The whole idea about 5G, that the computing is done very nearly to the device versus the current system, that you take everything to a center, to a central router, core router, and then you return it back. So the secret is now in a kind of a very fast edge computing. Without this edge computing, you won't have 5G. But edge computing is important not for streaming video. It's important to autonomous cars when they will be. It's important to Amazon uh, sending their drones with pizza to your home. If this is for precision agriculture that can change a lot of the way that we provide food to people in many countries, including developed countries, and so on and so on. So the 5G will not change dramatically or better dramatically the situation unless the vendor, the provider, really wants to provide you dedicated bandwidth. Okay, other questions here? Yes, right here in the front. Hold on one second, Mike's coming to you. Okay, you've talked about the security risks. What about um, health risks? Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's going to be power, energy. You're saying it's going to be 100 times more powerful to mm. support this network, are there any type of health concerns that anybody should be worried about? Also, and by moving up to the higher end of the spectrum, the millimeter part of the spectrum, does that reduce health concerns? Who wants to handle that, VJ? Um, I'm, I'm, do you have an answer to that? I don't think, I mean, millimeter wave has been around uh, for the last 50 years. Actually, most of the mobile network's backhaul is, use, is used, uh, we use millimeter waves, right? So mo I think a majority of the European backhaul of the, of the traffic in the mobile network is millimeter wave, right? So it's been around for a long time. I think uh, I, I, I have not seen anything that suggests that there are any issues. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the throughput of uh, 100 times or 1,000 times is a function of how much a spectrum you have, right? And uh, so you have these wide, you know, swaths of spectrum, and that's the reason why obviously your throughput goes up, right? So it's not you're you're pumping a thousand times more power per se, but that you know you're you have a super highway of like wider lanes, and so yeah. I mean, yeah. and and the right. like the the, uh, the the power consumption of the overall system is lower. Is lower than actually. it is today. Yes. Uh, and when you look at um, spectrum handling and a number of things. I mean, a lot of the, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you almost set aside some scientific evidence as to whether there's health issues around these things or not, if you just go ahead and take some people's fears, you know, at face value, um, th th those have actually been taken account into the designs because, you know, one of the most, you know, mo mobile networks are regulated on a local level. Uh, and it's a very common stated concern that limits how you can do coverage. And so a lot of the response on the vendor side was, uh, we just said, okay, you know what, Let, let's, let's just address that then. If you think that it's basically looking like this, then let's completely dramatically change what the electromagnetic profile of it coming off and everything else. Let's, let's, not a, let's set aside the idea of whether it causes cancer or not. If you're truly concerned about being exposed to this, then let's limit that exposure. One, um, that we, I think we have time for just one or two more. I had a question about so, networks. Um, 
so Verizon uses CDMA, AT&T uses GSM, different network, or is it, yeah. will there be one network or still multiple networks? That this no, like that, that, like that, for example, that, that um, the, the, those different networks here in the U.S. have all been uh, turned off and don't exist anymore. Uh, so that, that difference. So it's if, all, it's all now. If you see LTE, I mean, just about everybody sees LTE on their phone and those, those legacy networks were decommissioned. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one, one network. Right over here. Thank you. As more and more financial transactions get conducted over the internet and utilizing the mobile phone, yeah. for those of you who use your mobile phone, for instance, to buy your coffee in the morning or to spend on your lunch, um, as many of us do here in California, what is and how will cybersecurity change over 5G from what we are utilizing today? And is there a greater danger to all of our bank accounts using 5G, and how will we handle it? V? Well, uh, first, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but you should be careful from bankers even without 5G. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them went bankrupt without having mobile phones. So, um, uh, <laughs> so, but definitely a new dimension of security uh, is needed. If uh, 50 years ago uh, you had Bonnie and Clyde robbing a bank and all the police running with sirens after them, today uh, average Russian hacker will not uh, take off his pyjama for uh, 10 percent, 10 times more the money. Uh, so it will be a constant battle and there is a more and more service that is being given by different companies <laughs> Uh, and the security profile is being examined now <coughs> against cyber attack by insurance companies. And the result of it is that cyber packages far more sophisticated are being offered. At the very same time, chip manufacturers like ARM are already integrating <coughs> in their architecture, which is called RISC, reduced instruction sets, a lot of <coughs> safety features that are can be reprogrammed as the threat changes, and this did not exist in, uh, in uh, the existing network that basically you make all kinds of patches, okay? All kinds of patches, but the cybersecurity packages that you are starting to see now are far, far more sophisticated, and most of them are aimed on for the financial industry. There is no, no doubt about it, because the, in the end, crime is about stealing money. CJ, you get the last word. Well, yeah, uh, I totally agree with you. As a matter of fact, artificial intelligence is coming into the cybersecurity market. One of the biggest use cases, and I, I see, um, you know, uh, one of my uh, uh, friends here, I think, in the audience, um, he, uh, you know, CrowdStrike is is an example of of artificial intelligence being applied to, uh, to cybersecurity, um, and they're doing phenomenally well. We have a cybersecurity product which uses AI to protect, so um, yeah, so last word. Well, I want to um, thank all three members of our uh, panel. This has been uh, a great uh, discussion. I write about this stuff for a living, and I learned a huge amount from all three of you, so I thank you much, and I want to thank our audience for such great questions, and um, for um, sticking with us uh, all the way to the uh, to the bitter end here. So now go enjoy the evening. Thanks very much.